Yeah, crossover welcome to week three. Oh, this is how we do it. Yeah. Ooh, there we go. There we go. Welcome to week three of This Is How We Do It. We are talking about relationships and marriage and echoey microphones. <laughs> Should I get another mic? One, two, check, check, one, two. All right, grab me another microphone back there. Um, so we are talking about relationships. We're talking about marriage. We are talking about covenant today. And I'm just going to turn this off away. All right, there we go. Y'all hear me good? All right. It worked, worked great first service. I don't know. I don't know. But we're, we're in our, our series called This Is How We Do It. And the first week we had Montel Jordan and his wife here. Wasn't that amazing? Yeah. We had 88 people get baptized that Sunday. It was just an incredible week, two weeks ago. And they talked about first things first. And they talked about priorities. If you guys missed it, you can catch it on our YouTube channel, Crossover 813. Last week I got to do the message, the pleasure of doing the message with my wifey, Lucy. And... Uh, and we talked about that we all have some holes in our buckets, don't we? And, and guess what? Our spouse or the person we marry or we're going to marry, they're not the ones that can fix it. It's only God. He's the one that can fix it. And so we talked about we need to remove some things sometimes. We need to let God repair some things. And then we need to continually get refilled. So um, remove, repair, refill. Then what? Repeat. Repeat. Y'all got it. Y'all got it. And what's the thing that completes us? Not our spouse, but who is it? God, it's Jesus. He completes us. And so today we're going to be talking about covenant. And speaking of covenant, in two weeks from now, if you are married and you've never renewed your vows and you want to do that, we're going to have a really special service. In all three services, we are going to be doing a vow renewal. So if you're interested in renewing your vows that day, it's going to be special. We're going to do a real, I'm going to suit up and everything. Pastor Christopher, he suits up usually anyways, but he's going to wear a tie that day. I'm going to wear a tie too, man. So uh, it's going to be a special day. If you want to renew your vows, you can register at the website and let us know that as well. Invite some family and friends. It's going to be awesome. And so, but here's the thing today is we're talking about covenant. If you're married, we got any married people in the building? Okay, we got some. Cool. If you're married, you could be tempted during this message to make comments like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell him, Pastor Tommy. He needs to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Or, fellas, you could be tempted to be like, go ahead, Pastor T, preach, preach. I've been trying to tell her that. Go ahead, go ahead. You know, uh, listen, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Listen to this message for yourself. And I know we got a lot of single people in the building, too. We got any single people? Where are you at, single people? Okay. So if you are single, don't be tempted that, well, I'm just going to tune out. Don't do that. Yes, we are going to talk about covenant today, and in specific, the marriage covenant. But here's the thing, y'all. That is the thing that as we look in scripture, it mirrors our relationship with God. And so many times that's mentioned as a comparison. So this is applicable to all of us today, no matter where you're at in your Facebook relationship status, okay? So do me a favor, pull out your phones if you downloaded this, the crossover app and uh, follow along with the notes. If you're worshiping online, you can do that as well. Uh, or if you want to take notes physically inside of your program, there is a note sheet, so you guys can grab that as well. And here's the first thing to write down, guys. Very first thing. There's a difference between a contract and a covenant. There's a difference between a contract uh, and a covenant. So a contract is this. It's there to protect your rights, and to limit your responsibilities. That's what, that's what a contract does. There to protect your rights and to limit the responsibilities that you have. So in my hands right here, I'm holding up um, several different real contracts that I've had over my life. There's a record contract here, licensing contract here, a book publishing contract, I've signed distribution contracts, television contracts, real estate contracts. As just a kid growing up in Philly, low income, I never thought I'd be like dealing with all these contracts, right? I had to learn to you know, navigate a lot of legal, legal language and whatnot. Uh, but see, these contracts, you know what they're created for? They're created for 
to protect my rights and to limit my responsibilities. But guess what? For the other person, the other party that signed these contracts, the same exact thing goes for them as well. This is drawn up to protect their rights and to limit their responsibilities as well. See, here's the thing, y'all. Um, if we look at marriage like this, it's not going to work. It's just, it's just not going to work. Instead, God designed marriage to be not a contract, but a covenant. So what's a covenant? Write this down. Here's what a covenant is. Definition. Covenant is where we lay down our rights and we pick up our responsibilities. Whoa. Okay. But that's the only way that Christianity works. That's the only way that marriage will work. It's, it's got to be a covenant, not a contract. So we got to lay down three rights. Here's, here's three rights we got to lay down. Write this down. First one is this. I'm going to give you three, three Ps. First one is priority. You have to lay down your right of priority and put God first in every area of your life. And then when you get married, you have this marriage covenant with your spouse. That person has to become the first person under God. So God's first, and then secondly, that person, your spouse, their, their priority number one. Not your kids, not your job, not your best friend. Not, no, it's that person. We talked about that in week one when Montel was here, right? So, so here's the second one, possession. Possession. First one's priority, second one's possession, that you now, you co-own and co-administrate every possession that you have. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Look at me real quick. Look at me real quick. One bank account. One bank account. I know I'm about to step on some toes, but I'm doing it because I love you, okay? So when you get married, like when I got married to Lucy, my bills became her bills. Her school loans became my school loans. By the way, she had a lot more than me. But, but I didn't beef because I agreed that, you know, the two are becoming one and everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine, including debt. It's not like, well, you know, you brought that debt into the marriage. That's yours. That's your credit card. That's your bills. I, I've had so many conversations with married couples over the last two decades of being a pastor and crazy stuff with like, you know, yeah, well, you know, like we fighting right now because like, you know, the cable got turned off and that's his bill and he hasn't paid it for three months. He didn't bring, give, me, give me his money for the mortgage. You know, well, you know, Pastor T, I, I just, I'm really upset with her now. We haven't talked in three weeks because, you know, she owes me $350. She borrowed that money from me, and she never paid it back, and she won't even bring it up. And I'm just tired. She always does this to me. She borrows money and doesn't give it back to me. When I hear that kind of stuff, it sounds like you just are roommates. You're friends. That's not what marriage covenant is supposed to be. This past week, I had a good friend of mine that he's going through a nasty divorce right now, and he just recently had a court deposition in the court deposition, it was revealed to him for the first time that two years ago, while he was married, his wife got a check for $54,000. I don't know about you, but $54,000, that's a lot of money. I could change my life, right? She got this money, and she never told him because she had a separate bank account, and she was living a separate life. That's not going to work, y'all. That's not going to work. So the two should become one, including your bank account, your possessions, your finances. Now, yeah, if you want to have a savings account or you want to have a vacation account, cool, but there's transparency across the board, and it all is in one pot. You're doing this together. Somebody say together. 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 And come on, guys. I love y'all. Here's the third P, privacy. You have no more privacy. You give your spouse the right, my, my spouse has the right to look at my phone anytime. She has my passwords, my social media stuff, my computer, my iPad, all. She has access to all those things. You know why? Why wouldn't she? I have nothing to hide. She has nothing to hide. It's, it's, it's accountability. There, there, there should be no privacy. Now, I, I will admit she recently did this thing called the, the 360 app, Life 360. Anybody know about that? 
So like all of our phones and our family have that, and she can see where, where I'm at at all times, which I don't mind, but sometimes I'm, when you're coming home, oh, I'm about to leave. You know, I'm about to leave. I'll be home for dinner in a few minutes. Fifteen minutes later, you ain't left yet. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm like, refresh it, refresh it. I'm on the way. That's happened a few times. <laughs> but seriously, I, I, have, I have no problem with that because we're in this together. I have nothing to hide from her. And so some of you may have trust issues and baggage from past relationships. you got to work that out and work on that so you can get to the point to where you can fully trust each other. And there's not secret lives. There's none of that. No, you lay down your priority. You lay down your possessions. You lay down your privacy. So let's go to God's Word. If you guys got your Bibles, if you want to turn with me to uh, the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. And Paul wrote this. Uh, some great instructions to husbands and to wives, and future husbands and future wives as well. And I've read this passage and preached on it many, many times because this is one of the ones I refer to when I do weddings. And I've done uh, close to close to 70 weddings now. It's crazy. Uh, but it says this, starting in, in verse 22. It says, for wives. We got any wives in the house? Wives, make some noise. All right, ladies. It says, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in what? In everything. That was a quiet everything. (laughs) That was mostly women. I heard everything. (laughs) Listen, this is some verses that guys love to point out. In the Bible. Don't do that. And learn to take the passage in context. Okay, because we're going to talk about context. Somebody say context. Because context is so important. When you hear a conversation, if you only pull out a couple little sentences from the conversation, it can totally change the meaning, right? So let's look at the real context of this. Because So that's the part for women. And let's look at the next part for, for husbands. Husbands, where are you at? Husbands. I was a little bit weaker. I think there was a little intimidation there of like, oh, what am I saying yes to? For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Who's the church? Not the old Toys R Us building on Fowler Avenue. The church is, is if you have a relationship with Jesus, it's you. It's me. And you got issues. And I have issues too, right? But Christ still loves us. As a matter of fact, it goes on and it says, he gave up his life for her. Are you willing, husbands, to give up your life for your spouse? That's what Paul's saying here. We need to. It says to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Now look at verse 28. It says, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. You know what? That, those couple of verses right there, honestly, can be a problem today. They can be a problem because there's so many men that are unsure of what manhood looks like because they haven't had a good male role model in their life. They haven't had a father. They haven't had a good male role model. They haven't seen what a solid Christian man should and could look what like. And so they're... But so if you can't love yourself, then you can't properly love your spouse or your kids or your friends or other people that are around you. And that, that's a crisis and an epidemic that, that we have in our culture. So men, men, where you at? Make some noise, men. Married and unmarried men, single men. Like, man, learn to love yourselves. Not in a way of like, you know, just doing whatever you want because we're good at that, right? Not in the narcissistic type of love of just, you know, doing whatever you want and just, no, but in a way that you're making healthy decisions, godly decisions, and, and you're healthy and you're balanced. That's what someone that really loves themselves, they, they treat themselves like that. That's what Paul is referring to here. Like you're going to love yourself 
And in the same way, then you're going to love your spouse. It goes on and it says, it says, and we're members of his body. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into what? One. United into one. One bank account. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way that Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now I know that some of you might be reading this, and if you're a wife in here, um, and you are like, man, you know, you might be in here and say, my wife isn't submitting like that. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. You have to be willing that at any opportunity that you're the one that is willing to bring redemption to your marriage when there's issues, to bring redemption. See, that word covenant, it actually comes from the word, and it actually means cut. And guess what? Jesus was cut, and he bled, and he was beaten, and he sacrificed, and he laid his life out for you and for me so we could have this new covenant that we could have forgiveness and new life. That's what Jesus did for us. So if you're married, there's going to be some moments where you got to be willing to get cut. You're going to have to sacrifice some things. You're going to have to compromise some things. There's going to be some things that you are going to go through. And, And listen, if you have marriage problems today, I'm going to solve them for you right now. Okay, y'all ready? Are y'all ready? Y'all with me? This is, if you have marriage problems, simply this is what you need to do. You just need to die. That's it. You just need to die. Ah, I can leave now. The message is over. Not die and like go to heaven, but I'm saying you need to die spiritually and die to your own will and your own agenda. And you just need to serve that other person and and love them. I mean, think about it. Think about it. What if you were just like, honey, whatever you want, whatever you want, I got you. You say, whatever you want, I got you. We're here for each other. We we got each other. It's not my will, but but what do you need? I'm here to serve you. Man, if you would just both die to your rights, amazing stuff could happen. So let's talk about the three responsibilities now that you got to pick up. So you got to lay down. Priority, possessions, privacy. But here's what you got to pick up. The first one is love. Love. I know some of y'all are like, duh. (laughs) Hold on. Because the definition that you have of love might be very different than the one that I'm going to present here in a minute. That you're going to amen anyways and act like you, yeah, okay. But for real, let let me give you the the real definition. Because culture and music videos and songs and you know, movies and everything else has redefined what love is, but this is the kind of love I'm talking about that we got to pick up. The kind of love that says, I assume assume the responsibility to love you according to the standard of whose love? And never justify any action or word that falls below that standard. Woo! That's tough right there. Because Jesus' love for you and for me is unconditional. It's unconditional. Romans 5, 8, it talks about where while we were yet sinners, we were still in our dirt, we were still wilding out, that Jesus still died for us. He laid his life down, and he loved us so much that he gave his life for you and for me. And so what that means, as we translate that for us, so even if your spouse is not doing the right thing, that you're going to hold it down. Even when they're having a bad day, you're still going to love them. Even when their hormones are out of whack, you're still going to love them. Even when they, uh, you know who their mother is, their mama, and she reminds you of her sometimes, you're still going to love her. Like you are committing to the day I die, I'm going to love you. I'm ride or die. I got your back. I'm here for you. This is a covenant. It's unbreakable. So here's another difference between a, a, a contract and a covenant. So a contract says, if you don't fulfill your part, then I don't have to fulfill my part. So it will void it out. If you're not following through with X, Y, and Z, then hey, I don't got to do my part. And listen, y'all, with marriage, that's not going to work. Because we've already tried that, haven't we, married people? 
Come on, how'd that work out for you? How'd that work out for me? Well, if you're not meeting my needs, I'm not going to meet your needs. If you're not respecting me, I'm not going to respect you. If you're not going to love me, I won't love you. Listen, that's not going to work. So if marriage is sick, if your marriage is sick, then put some medicine on it. Stop trying to open up the wound more and like pour salt on it and just make it even worse. Like if your wife is disrespecting you, just show her love, pray for her, and watch God begin to turn her heart. If your husband is not loving you the way that he should, like just respect him, just love on him. And just, just watch, pray for him and watch how God can begin to change the situation and the scenario. Do your part and watch God do, watch God do the rest. Watch God do the rest. Listen, there were seasons earlier in my marriage where sometimes my wife and I would get into a conflict. And it can easily become this competition thing, right? I ain't making up this time. And you just pass each other and be like, Waiting for the other person to break. She's going to break first this time. And, and, and hours can go by, and days can go by, and for us, it never turned into weeks. But for some people, weeks and months and even years, it can turn into where there's grudges that are held because they're like, nah, I'm not, I'm not. Last week, we talked about the, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5 in specific says, true love keeps no record of wrongs. So some of y'all are like, man, I made, up, I made up the last three times, and it wasn't even my fault. Listen, real love doesn't even keep records of wrong. But we're so caught up of like, oh, man, it becomes this competition almost of like, listen, don't, don't go there. You should always be the bigger person to bring redemption to your marriage, to bring redemption to your relationship, especially fellas, husbands. We're called to be the spiritual leaders, and when you're the leader, sometimes you take some extra hits. I know I've been a leader, not just in my marriage, but in the church and in so many other regards and different positions I've had. Sometimes leaders, man, and pioneers, you could take some different kinds of hits, but God will help you. He'll equip you. He'll give you the strength, and trust me, when you're fighting for the person that you love, that God's called you to be with, it's worth it. It's worth it, y'all. Can I get an amen? And like, y'all just looking at me like, okay, is it worth it? I don't know. <laughs> Listen, just love your husband, love your wife the way that, that Christ loves us. Here's the thing about when you first get married. Maybe you never thought of this before, but you are, you are basically eating somebody else, else's crop. You're enjoying somebody else's crop. Now think about it, maybe you never thought about that before, but somebody else has planted the seeds, watered it, fertilized it, cultivated it, and now you get married, and that's what you got. That's what you got. And of course, before you get married, like it looks extra good, but then when you get married, you discover some other things. Like, oh, I didn't know that. You know, well, this is, you know, <laughs> you find about all kinds of stuff because other things have, so what, 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 ex, what, what influence is that? Their parents, their family, where they grew up at, their environment, their friends, their life experiences, the media that they consumed. And so when me and Lucy first got married, there was some things about each other's crops and lives that, that we didn't fully enjoy. I had to realize there were some things in her family upbringing that were not totally healthy. And so some expectations and some rhythms and things that she saw, and, and it just wasn't totally healthy. At the same time, my family might have been a little bit healthier, but there was friends and there was experiences and places I hung out and media I consumed that there were some things in my life that were not healthy and not where they needed to be. So we had a choice to get upset and be like, oh man, all this baggage that you brought in, and, and then just keep planting more bad seeds or to plant good seeds. And so it's going to be different from now on. Because we can always then begin to worry, worry about and wonder, did I marry the wrong person? And then we start to look over there and over there. And is the grass greener over there? Listen, y'all, water your own grass. Fertilize your own grass. Take care of what God has given you and cultivate that. And so we begin to plant seeds of encouragement and love and support and 
challenging each other and holding each other accountable, but we began to pour into each other and plant these seeds. And now, 22 years later, it's a beautiful crop. It's a beautiful life. And, and the way that we enjoy one another is incredible. Why? Because we've invested and we planted and we watered and we fertilized and we cultivated. So 22 years into it, it's not harder. It's not worse. We're not tired of each other. It's better than ever. And I can stand up here on this platform and totally say that, like, my marriage is healthy. It's, it's great. It's not perfect, but it's really good. And there's hope. No matter if you've been married two months or 25 years or 50 years, like, there's hope. And it's just what are you planting? What kind of seeds? What are you doing? It can be healthy. It can be balanced. There can be great things that happen. Whatever stage, whatever season that you're at. In, in, in your life. And so I got a loving wife that honors me and loves me. And, and Lucy, she's got a loving husband that takes care of her. Took a w- little while to get there, but it's good. So good. So what are you planting? So your responsibility is to love your spouse. Here's the second one in covenant is to honor. Honor. I assume the responsibility to honor you and do everything possible to help you achieve your highest potential in God's plan for your life. Listen, this is God's design all the way back from the beginning of the Bible. We looked at it last week, Genesis chapter 2, that Adam and Eve, like God created Eve to be a helper for Adam. And then Adam's also be a helper for Eve. And they were together in this life, in this partnership, in this covenant together to help each other. So listen, I'm never going to fully reach my potential without Lucy. Lucy's never going to fully reach her potential without Tommy. I mean, because that's God's plan for our lives. And so, now listen, Lucy is not the thing that completes me. We talked about that last week. Jesus is the thing that completes me, right? But because she's the one that's called to be my spouse, my wife, for life, because of that, then when she's in my life and we're on the same page and we're healthy and we're whole and we're doing the things we're supposed to, she's going to be able to elevate me to a level that I'd never be without her. Now listen, I know there's some of you in here that are single, and you know maybe God is going to call you to stay single. Some of you are going to be single and celibate, and that's your calling. Listen, if if you're single, and even in this season, you can do even more for God. You can do even more because you don't have the responsibilities of covenant right now. And maybe you will someday. I mean, the writer of Ephesians, Paul, he stayed single intentionally because he felt that was his calling. Singleness can be a gift. There can be a lot of great things you can do while you're single. Many times our culture makes it feel like, oh, it's a curse, I'm single, I just need somebody. Like, enjoy the single season. There can be some great things to it. And, and many of you, though, you are going to get married. Or you're going to get married if you were married a while ago and you're divorced or you're widowed or whatever. Maybe you're going to get married again. And in that new covenant, that relationship that you have, like, you're going to go to a new level because that's God's plan that he has for you. So if you're married, you know what? God's going to ask you someday, what did you do with your greatest gift? He's going to ask me, what did you do with your greatest gift? And my greatest gift is not preaching and leading or rapping or writing books or all the different things that God's allowed me to do. Those aren't my greatest gifts. That's my greatest gift right there, my wife. He's going to say, what did you do with Lucy? Did you love her? Did you support her? Did you lead her? Did you help her become everything that I've called her to be because I put you together so you could help her and she could help you. This past Wednesday night, I'm going to brag on my wife for a minute, all right? Even if you don't like it. Um, this past Wednesday night, she taught the Bible study, the Re-Up Bible study. I mean, she spoke with me last week. She leads the women's ministry here. Some of y'all don't know if I could take you back like 15, 20 years just to get Lucy up here to hold a microphone and maybe do an announcement or say a prayer. Oh, man, that was a big deal. I mean, I didn't say this first service, but I remember like watching on video one time. She was up there doing announcements and we saw her hand was like she was smooth up here, but her hand was like shaking, you know, because she just hated it. She did not like it when I would ask her to do that stuff. Sometimes I'll be in the doghouse, but I pushed her, and I challenged her because I knew she had this gift and this talent and this ability, and it was inside of her, and we had to mine it out of there. And and now today, like, to see how God is using her, it's amazing. And for her to see it, she loves it. She enjoys it now. 
And God has developed her in that area, in that gift. Uh, uh, years ago, I, I mean, I, I felt like, man, you have a voice to write something as well, to write. And so, I don't know, I don't know, you know. Well, just last year, she signed a publishing deal uh, with a publisher. And just, just last week, she got her final revision of the book that she co-authored with another pastor's wife, and it's coming out on Mother's Day. Yeah. So now I got an author wife. Super, super proud of her, for real, for real. Now, now listen, let me say this to, to wives and to husbands, too. If you're around a group of people publicly and they're tearing their spouse down, don't jump in and do the same thing. Don't do that. Because when you publicly bash your spouse, even if your spouse is not holding it down in certain areas, just don't, just don't jump in and participate in that. Because that's just, it's, it's not right. Tearing your spouse down in front of other people, it's, it's, we, have, we have the choice to speak words of life or to speak death. So speak life. Say, you know, no, my husband's a great guy. I'm sorry that your husband's going through that and doing those things, but my husband does this, this, and this. And he might not be hitting on all five cylinders, but there's some good things you can still say about him. Fellas, there's some good things you can say about your wife. She's a great mom, or, you know, she's a great cook, or she does this or that. You know, like find ways to speak life about your spouse. You know, a few weeks ago when Montel was here, his wife, he was sharing about his wife and how she spoke words of life over him even when it wasn't fully <laughs> real at that point. He's like, you're a great husband, you're a great father. And he was like, I wasn't those things yet. I was still struggling in those areas. But she kept speaking it on me and, and speaking it on me. And God began to develop it in me to where he became those things. So speak words of life over your spouse. And, and listen, I would never be the man that I am today without my wife. To be able to do all the things that I do and all the things God's allowed me to do and accomplish. I would have never been able to do that without my wife praying for me supporting me, cheering me on, challenging me at points, you know, um, holding me accountable in different areas, you know, letting me travel at different points, cooking for me, oro con pollo, aleluya, yeah, I mean, yeah, I can honor that, for real, I can honor that, so honor your spouse, find ways to honor them, so uh, love your spouse, honor them, here's the last one, guys, submission, submission, these are for both. Somebody say both. Both of you need to love each other, honor each other, submit to each other. So this is saying I assume the responsibility to serve you by submitting my life to Christ and by surrendering to his word as the standard for my life and my marriage and my family. So we started out by reading Ephesians chapter 5. Remember how we said context? Context is so important in any conversation. You don't want us to just pick certain parts out. So we actually started in verse 22. I did that intentionally, and it talked about wives. In verse 25, it moved on and talked about husbands. But let's go back to the beginning of the passage, verse 21. This is what verse 21 says about relationships for husbands and wives. It says, and further, submit to who? Submit to who? Somebody say one another. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ one another so there's going to be times husbands when you do have to submit or compromise or sacrifice some things for your wife wives there's going to be times you have to submit compromise sacrifice some things for your husband even if they're not holding it down because what did it say in verse the end of verse 21 it said in reverence for who for Christ in reverence for Christ and reverence to say, man, I want to have a marriage that's honoring God, and, and maybe it's not perfect right now, but I want to do it the right way. So listen, there's conflict in every marriage, but where are you going for, for help with that conflict? You know, George Barney does all this research about the church, and married couples that are Christian, only one-third of them go to the Bible for conflict resolution. That's it. That's it. Just, just one-third. Listen, but they, they don't say, what does the Bible say? You know, the Bible says I'm supposed to lay down my life for you. That solves everything right there, right? If, if, if you just lay down your life, lay down your rights, and say, hey, I'm just here to serve you, that would solve everything right there. But when the Bible is not the standard, here's what the standard is. The standard is whatever you think. The standard is whatever they think. 
And where did they get that? Well, they got it from some of their life experience. They got it from Oprah. They got it from TV. They got it from something they saw on Facebook. They got it from their best friend. They got it from all these different places. They're pulling these standards together and trying to mix it and say, well, this is what I think it should be. No, this is what I think it should be. And, and then you know who wins the fight? Well, it's usually whoever has the strongest willpower. Sometimes it's no one, but a lot of times there's somebody that's a little stronger and won't give up. And then there's somebody else that just gets passive, like, oh, I'm just exhausted. I'm tired of fighting with you. Because we see it in a lot of relationships, right? Where there's one person that can sometimes kind of bully the other person in an unhealthy relationship, right? And so, but that, that person that gets bullied again and again, eventually they get tired and they check out. And we see so many marriages that end in divorce because this is not the standard. If God's word was the standard, man, we should be able to solve the problems. I'm not saying it's simple, I'm not saying it's always easy, but you can work through it when you commit and say, listen, I'm gonna lay down my rights, I'm gonna pick up my responsibilities, and I'm gonna love you, I'm gonna honor you, I'm gonna submit to you, because that's what God's word tells me to do. Amen? And you know what this does? It paints a picture of what Jesus did for us. That's what covenant means. It's what Jesus did for you and for me. I want to read a couple more verses as we get ready to close out today. And this talks about, in specific, that covenant, that new covenant. This is found in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, if you guys want to turn there. And I'm going to start in verse, uh, verse 12. This is talking about Christ as the perfect sacrifice. It says, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place one, once for all time and secured our redemption forever. This is talking about Jesus with his blood, with his blood. See, back in the day, they, they used to have what's called the old system, the old covenant. You would have to bring an animal to church if you wanted to be forgiven of your sins. So you might bring like a goat or a calf or a, a bird or something, and you bring it to the pastor, the priest, and they would take it into a holy room that you couldn't go in, and they would sacrifice that animal, and blood would be shed, and they would pray on your behalf, and then you could be forgiven of your sins. I know that sounds crazy to us. It sounds so foreign. It's, but there was that shedding of blood that had to be there for forgiveness. What well, says here, like it says, with his own blood, with Jesus' blood, he entered the most holy place once for all time, and he secured our redemption forever. Look at verse 13. It says, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify your consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as, as what kind of sacrifice for our sins? Perfect sacrifice. Verse 15, it says, that's why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance he has promised them. The mediator. That's Jesus. Because back in the day, you would have to bring this sacrifice to the temple and you would give it to the priest and then he would take it into the Holy of Holies and sacrifice it on your behalf. Now it says that you don't need a priest or a pastor or a spiritual leader to go to God on your behalf to get forgiveness of your sins. You have a relationship with Jesus and guess what? You have access right there because he is our mediator. Isn't that incredible? He's our mediator. The old system, the old covenant is gone. Jesus is the new covenant. And here's the other thing you might have not caught. It talked about this eternal inheritance that we now have because of Jesus. Anybody here ever get an inheritance? <laughs> right? We wish, right? Like you rich, wish you had like a rich uncle you didn't know about or something. Like, like what if you found out what if tomorrow Bill Gates died and you found out that you were actually part of the family? Hello. And you got a share of his 
billions and billions of dollars, you would be like, somebody here would be shouting right now. You know, but, but listen, so much greater than if you were part of Bill Gates' family, you're now part of the creator of the universe's family, who's way more wealthier, way more connected, way more powerful than the richest man on this planet. We're talking about God. You are now have direct access. You're part of his family. You have this eternal inheritance. And, and maybe your life is challenging and there's some hard times and some suffering you've gone through. Maybe even your covenant relationship with your marriage is not where it should be or it's was already was broken and, and there's just been so much stuff listen if you have a relationship with Jesus and you're in that covenant with Jesus when this life is over this, this life will never be perfect but when you die you're gonna have that eternal inheritance and the stuff that you're gonna have in the next life we can't even dream or imagine the stuff that God has the technology the things that that are gonna be awaiting for us in heaven the love being his presence the, he's perfect like that's better than any rich uncle could ever give us, right? That's what we have to look forward to. And we have all that because of what Jesus did for us. This new covenant where he died on the cross for my sins and your sins. That's the gospel, the good news. And there's nothing we can do to earn it. He freely gave it while we were yet in our sins. We just simply have to say, yes, I receive it and I commit to follow. I'm going to follow you. I want to be part of your family. I want to pray for you today. I want you to bow your heads around the room. If you're here today, if you're here and you're not sure that you're in a covenant relationship with Jesus, with your creator, you can make sure of that right here, right now. A lot of stuff in scripture that talks about it. We all can have access to it. It's not just for a certain group of people or people that didn't make mistakes or people that have a certain bank account or people that are a certain skin color. No, it's, it's for everyone. It's available for everyone. It's not exclusive for some group. It's inclusive for everyone. So you can experience that today. If you're here and you say, I believe and I want to make sure that my relationship is right with Jesus. Maybe you've never done that before. You've never prayed to get right with Jesus and start a relationship. Or maybe you have at some point, but you fell off and slipped away. And today you want to come back home. If that's you today, as everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I just want you to slip your hand up if that's you. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. Thank you. I'll see you guys. I'll see you. Awesome. I'll see you. I'll see you even in the back. If you're worshiping with us online, God sees you. Sees your response as well. I want to pray with you guys. And uh, if you just would say this prayer with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your new covenant. Thank you for your son Jesus. I believe he came to the earth, died on the cross for my sins. He rose again three days later. I believe that his blood that was shed was that final sacrifice not can be made brand new so I ask for forgiveness today I ask that you make me brand new I want to be part of your family you'll be my mediator to God the Father and I'm looking forward to my eternal inheritance to be with you and experience all the good things you have in Jesus name in Jesus name I want to ask our First Impressions team to come down because what we're going to do now, this last closing moments of our time together, this worship experience, is we're going to remember the covenant, the new covenant that God made with us. And we're going to take communion together. And so I'm going to ask our First Impressions team to serve you. They're going to serve you uh, one of these little communion cups, and you can open it up and just hold on to it. And after everybody is served, we're going to give you instructions to go ahead and... Uh, and take it together, and then we're going to do a final closing prayer. So as everybody's being served, I want you to just take a few moments and reflect on where you're at with God. If there's some things you just need to talk to him about, ask for forgiveness. But if you're here and you have a relationship with Jesus, we want to invite you to partake with us. You have won the 
chapter 11, Paul writes these words about the Last Supper, about communion. He said, for I pass on to you this, what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus, he took some bread and he gave thanks to it, to God for it, and he broke it in pieces and he said, this is my body which is given to you. Do this to remember me. So if you take the bread together. Just remember God's body broken for us. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement that's confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's partake of the cup together. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. Final sacrifice once and for all, for all of us, so we can be redeemed. We thank you for the new covenant that we can come directly to you. Whenever we need anything, whenever we're going through something, we can talk directly to you. We thank you, God, for your blood that was shed, for your sacrifice, for your life. Words can't even articulate our gratitude, but today we say thank you. We love you. God, help us to live out this covenant with you as we lay down our rights and we pick up our responsibilities. Those of us that are married, God, help us to mirror that in our marriage relationship. Those of us that are going to be married again, help us to learn from today and apply that as well. So God, use us as we go today. May we be a light in our neighborhood, in our jobs, at our schools. Everywhere that we go, God, that people can see how we do it as we represent you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. If you would stand with me and make some noise for the Lord today. Give it up for Jesus today, for his sacrifice, his covenant. Come on, come on. We can make a little more noise for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, this is our declaration that we do every week. And so 
This is our mission statement. We want to send you out with this to live life in 3D. So we're going to read this together on the count of three. Make sure after service you say what's up to some people in the lobby. Show some love. Stop by and say hello. Ready? One, two, three. Our mission is to empower people to discover, develop, and display Jesus Christ in every area of their life. God bless you guys. Live life in 3D.